Okay. Cool. So I think I've never done one before. I assume you haven't either. Um, I think the, the, the format is meant to be that uh, we'll ask some questions throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. So you won't just talk at us straight for 40 minutes, five minutes, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then anything else residual we have, we can have a discussion at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Should we start? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I, also, uh, uh, Chris is not, not going to be here tonight, right? I'm assuming. Um, All right. Uh, Chris. Chris. Is that how you say his name? Oh, Chris. Christian. Yeah, yes, Christian. yes. Oh, yeah. No, I guess not. Right. Yeah. Because it sounded like only one of us had to be here. That's what I thought. Somehow he ended up still on this list. But uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. No, I think it's just me. Yeah. Cool. <coughs> Hi guys, welcome to my master events. And uh, let's talk about how to generate some dynamic wallpaper today. But before that, I want to ask a question. Can machine create art? Usually people think of machine just do their usual routines, but artists can be creative and generate something new. Uh, but with the recent development in the deep learning, the state of art deep learning, it kind of uh, it kind of breaks the people's previous idea between the machine and art. For, for, for example, the first artist can uh, eat uh, artwork of previous people and uh, a photo with some content to generate a, a new artwork with the content from the photo and the art style from the previous artwork. The second artist is the artist can, uh, the input is a source image with some internal texture there, but it can generate a synthesized new picture with the same texture. So the third artist is like, uh, put this to the video domain. It can generate a new video uh, with some art style, uh, apply a art style to the video, uh, original video to generate a new video with that art style. So from those uh, three different artists, uh, we kind of sense there's two dimensions there. Uh, the first one is whether it's a photo or it's a video. The second is like, uh, if it's a style only, or texture only, or with content. So it's like we try to uh, since there's two dimensions here, we try to find the last corner of the, the, that word. So we define this problem as a problem to find the dynamic wallpaper. Uh, I really just want to cut into Chase and uh, tell you, you guys how to find the false artist. Uh, but before that, I need to talk just a little bit about deep learning. Uh, so deep learning is a special genre of the um, machine learning use deep neural network architecture. So the keywords is machine learning and the neural network. So what's machine learning? Supervised machine learning. Uh, it's like you always try to find the uh, ground truth function there. So there's two train, uh, two phase there. One is the training phase, one is the testing phase. Uh, and the corresponding training and the uh, testing data. 
For the training, you always have some feature, and you try to protect a label from that feature. And for the testing, you have a feature only, and you try to uh, make some new predictions. Uh, and uh, once you obtain the train model, uh, you can apply it here. That's uh, why we have this one. Uh, so that's like machine learning in one slide. So for the deep learning, uh, we have some restrictions on the model we choose. We only use neural network here, so it's no longer a model. It's uh, neural network, and the making prediction and uh, uh, and uh, how to generate that model are specifically called uh, uh, feedforward and backward propagations. Uh, so. Uh, so one question you might ask is why we just restrict to the uh, neural network instead of all the possible model, linear regression, whatever? Uh, it's because there's a theorem that all the functions can approximate by neural network. That's the behind the power of neural network. So mm -hmm. is that bad for generalization though? Uh, yeah, it, it can, like, if there's, uh, it can generate some lower fitting if the, the I think it's dependent on the data set we use. What do you think? So what 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 would you do? What do you do to control the dangers of overfitting with the neural network? Um, uh, uh, I can tweak the hyperparameter, like for example. But um, I think the data is really important. For example, for the AlphaGo. Uh, in order to eliminate, it actually is different on the test, but for example, for the AlphaGo, uh, they have some, uh, they use convolution on neural network, which is the same as this task. And they have some graph, uh, I mean, they have some Go, uh, you know, chart there, and they flip it over and right to left, top and down. And uh, it's like one photo can generate four photos in total. And this is a way to do the data augmentation there. And this might be helpful, I think. Okay. So uh, so that's the that's the uh, that's the deep learning uh, side. Uh, that's the machine learning for the deep learning. But uh, what's uh, uh, what is uh, uh, deep neural net architecture there? So there's a uh, different multiple layer structure. And uh, the first layer is always the input feature you have. And the last layer is always the label you try to predict. Uh, it's, it, which uh, can fulfill the uh, protocol of this uh, machine learning. Uh, but what is really interesting is the hidden layer uh, inside. Uh, so, um, uh, for example, if, uh, let's just assume I would have a Vector, uh, I mean the feature of this really small uh, feature, and I only have uh, one real number as the uh, as the label. That's my assumption here, uh, as as just, as suggested in this chart. Uh, what I uh, always do in the hidden layer is to do a linear uh, combination uh, and nonlinear linear transformation and nonlinear transformation. So uh, note here, I overload the notation of uh, x a little bit to incorporate the intersection term. Uh, and then I try to uh, get, uh, uh, I try to get uh, activation. That's why it's called A from this uh, sum. I just do a signal function, which is like this function. Uh, so the idea is like, uh, come from the real neural network. People like, uh, can either get uh, active, it, it, if this neuron is activated or not, so it's zero and one there, and uh, try to make this thing smooth. Um, but uh, recently people would like to use random, uh, some new uh, activation <laughs> function there. But uh, for this type, we just assume uh, this signal function. Uh, yeah. And uh, you generate, that's how you generate the activation in the hidden layer. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, that's only for the speed forward. Uh, how can you generate, uh, uh, 
how can you uh, go from an untrained model to a trained model? Uh, we use this uh, technique called backward propagation. Uh, and it's like, uh, initially, you always randomly initialize all the parameter uh, in the uh, uh, the parameter in your neural network, and then you randomly generate a label. Uh, but you try to uh, start from there uh, and uh, tweak these uh, parameters and uh, generate a trend model and uh, finally make some good predictions. Um, and uh, the problem is that how do you measure uh, the, the, mm, how good it is for, for your predict label? You can really have some uh, measure uh, to, uh, to define how good your prediction is. Uh, what we do here is like is to define a lock function. Uh, this lock uh, function is the uh, square of sum of the uh, difference between the true label and the label you generated and sum over all the data. Uh, which is uh, this is uh, this how we define our uh, uh, pred the prediction is uh, how good our, our model is, and uh, we try to plug uh, our uh, neural network functions into this loss function. Uh, and uh, what we actually see there is like a, a function, uh, a loss function over the parameter space, uh, uh, omega uh, w1 and w2, which is the parameter for the first layer and second layer. So you uh, actually, it's like, uh, if I draw a chart, it can be your loss function. And uh, you try to find the, uh, actually you try to find the local minima. Uh, I don't know how to find the global minima. Uh, so it, uh, so that's that's the picture I want to give you guys. Also note, I overload the activation here. Uh, from previous slide, I don't know if have a, a real number, a one dimension uh, real number as the activation. So here. I expand that uh, activation to the same dimension as the second layer's uh, parameters uh, dimension. Uh, some people also use uh, uh, matrix uh, to do this, uh, to generate the same result, but for me it's easier. That's how NumPy do the, do, uh, do the, do the implementation. So, so uh, there's another graph tell you how this process goes. So since we initialize uh, this entire neural network randomly, so it's like we randomly choose some uh, parameter in the uh, uh, weight space. So it will probably go here. And the idea is like to go from that uh, random point to the local minimum uh, and uh, in this weight space. Uh, it should be L, but I can't find a picture with L there, so I just... Uh, it also should be local minimum, but I can't find a good picture for that. <laughs> but anyway, you, you know the idea. And the idea is like to you always uh, find, the, uh, find your direction uh, by your uh, by gradient. So you always go to the uh, function of gradient. It's like you are climbing a, a mountain and uh, if you slide down to the bottom, you you know you can calculate where is exactly that direction. You see our gradient, which is like the uh, like gravity, or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, to be more precisely, uh, you update the weight uh, from your random position to the per, per, uh, the uh, the uh, direction. Uh, of your gradient, and you can uh, learn your rate for that. That's uh, how we do. That's how we do the backward probation. So, yeah, I and mean, it's only a local minimum, which bothered me a little bit, a little while. Okay, that's all for the deep learning. So, so that that is just general for doing gradient descent on any any class function. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's what makes it back propagation versus just Gradient descent. Um, backward propagation. Uh, actually, let me see. 
I feel like you actually don't have to do the backward propagation. You you just try to calculate the gradient, uh, and uh, you update the weight uh, like here. Uh, but we have a lot of parameters, right? Uh, what we have you have a lot of parameters. Uh, yes, uh, for a different layer. But it's in the actual calculation. It, it's like if you can calculate the previous layers. Uh, previous layers uh, gradient is easy to use that information to uh, uh, calculate the more previous uh, layers uh, information. So, but if not necessary, you can just calculate everything by hand. You need the first layer and the second layer, but that's well, very efficient. Very efficient. Yeah, very efficient. So that's how we do the backward propagation. Uh, okay. Uh, so. Uh, in the industrial world, uh, it's more like we need the economy is like we need to initialize the architecture and you define the face forward uh, to make prediction. Also, the backward, uh, which is is really easy to do. Uh, and here, okay. So that's all for the deep learning. So, but uh, remember, we want to generate some at least some image and a continuous image. We call that a video. So you can really use the uh, general uh, neural network to do all those stuff. Uh, because if you really think about the image, it can have millions of pixels there and uh, so many big dimensions. You really need to develop some strategy strategy to do the feature extraction, uh, which we call it a convolutional neural network. Uh, I have one more question. Um, um, I come from statistical physics, and uh, mm -hmm. people in statistical physics, you know, were obsessed with these kinds of things back in in the eighties. Um, so why are we hearing about it in the last, you know, five or so, five or ten years, and we weren't hearing about it in two thousand and nineties? Uh, it, it sounds what you just described sounds exactly like what people were talking about thirty years ago. <laughs> okay, so. We don't have the image that data set uh, at that point. So the data, and we don't have the computation power or the GPU acceleration mechanism there. Uh, uh, we do have the algorithm, but it should be a balance between the data algorithm uh, and the computational power, which is like today. Uh, okay, so some feature extraction mechanism. And uh, what uh, what we do here is uh, first we do convolution. Uh, that's why it's called convolutional neural network. Uh, when you think about convolution, you can think about this like a sliding window apply to a region of your image uh, here, and uh, it's it's like you always have one zero one this uh, number here, and uh, you call it a number here, and uh, what you notice is like the dimensions we used. You have a five by five uh, image initially, but you only have a three you only have a three by three feature uh, representation here. Uh, and uh, what can this convolution do uh, besides it can reduce the dimension? Uh, it can also uh, you can also send this one as a filter. That's what that uh, neural artist uh, a photo called. Uh, for example, if you define this uh, uh, this filter or this convolutional kernel here, and you apply to an ordinary image, you get a blur image. So it's a blur filter. Uh, just give you a, a sense of how this work. Uh, and convolutional neural network is like um, you have a, you have an image defined here, and uh, you can have multiple of the filter. Or a convolutional kernel here. For example, here I I would say there's three different uh, filters, and it can generate three different blocks. Here, that's the convolution, and then you do a pooling, uh, which I will talk uh, later. Uh, and always the convolution uh, pooling, convolution pooling, and the, the dimension are hugely reduced, and eventually uh, you go to the partial connect uh, uh, neural network to the fully connected neural network. And uh, generate some predictions. For this one, for this one, I assume it's a, a image classification task. Okay. 
question? Uh, so all note, notice that I do mention uh, the convolution, you can think about the convolutional layer as the partially connected neural network. So how can you know in this way? How can you know, how do you know that it's true? It's because if you always think about the, the activations, like for example, generally this one, which corresponds to this block, uh, all other uh, plays are, are not being counted. So which means they are not, uh, we didn't calculate anything from those layers. So there's no connection. So it's more like, uh, it's the fully connect uh, convolution, uh, uh, it's fully connect uh, neural network. But for this one, it's like this one. We only con uh, consider, uh, for this one, we only consider the neighborhood, this neighborhood, which, which is like uh, the three by three block here. So that's we uh, do the actual implementation of the neural network, uh, the convolution of neural network. Uh, yeah, that's like the implementation of this idea. So, uh, so that's all for the convolutional layer. Uh, another strategy we developed in order to reduce the dimension is by max pooling, uh, uh, all average pooling, but I just mentioned the average pooling. So it's like uh, you have a block of image or feature representation. You always uh, make it uh, split this to different blocks. And then you only keep the maximum uh, number in that region. For example, this one, the three is the largest number, so you keep that three and for that, for that block. So the assumption is like the largest number is the number that has the most important information. So, and uh, in the real uh, uh, implementation, we always uh, do this uh, after the convolutional layer. And uh, it should uh, at least uh, uh, reduce the dimension and uh, hopefully uh, keep the most important information but uh, omit the, uh, the information where does that information come from. Uh, okay, so that's a uh, convolution on your now. Okay, so finally we got this poem to, uh, to, uh, to introduce you guys the uh, machine artist. So that's an uh, image of tech, if you can, uh, you, can you can see there. And uh, there's an uh, image of art, and that's the uh, new art that we generate. Uh, so the idea is like, uh, we, choose a, uh, we choose a specific uh, convolution on neural network called VGG, which is a neural network called Rebels, uh, humans, uh, humans uh, image recognition task. Uh, so it's pretty uh, pretty good, pretty trained uh, convolutional neural network, and uh, we start from the uh, we always fix the parameter of VGG, the convolutional neural network, and uh, what we try to tweak there is the uh, uh, is the is the image itself. So we uh, we randomly initialize so the white noise, uh, we randomly initialize the image as a white noise. And then we do some optimalization task over that and finally generate the image. Uh, so the loss function definition is like this. Uh, so you have a content part and a style part. And you try to uh, balance the weight between those two guys by the upper beta. And uh, remind you, just remind you like the P here uh, is the photo and the A is the upper, and the X uh, is, is uh, the image you try to generate from the white noise to the dimensional, the dimensional product. Uh, and uh, the, the point, I guess, uh, among guess, is, is that you always have this uh, well-defined, uncalibrated um, uh, uh, VGG, and uh, you, uh, grab an uh, image, whatever, no matter it's a photo or artwork or the, uh, the white noise, and uh, you feed this image to your VGG. And uh, you all can always generate some feature representation in each layer of VGG. And uh, you use that, that information uh, uh, 
to calibrate to calibrate your white noise and eventually generate uh, eventually generate the the new image. Uh, so the uh, we start from the content loss. For the content loss is like uh, so just we just don't consider a deep uh, layer of the VGG first. Uh, as what I said, you plug this uh, photo to the VGG and then you generate some uh, feature representations. And then you plug this uh, white noise to your VGG and then you generate some feature representations. And then you try to minimize the difference between the uh, activation from your image of white noise. Uh, but most specifically, you have some index layer to, to talk, tell you about which filter, which layer. Uh, but the important thing is that like we some over uh, location, different filters. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty straightforward, because you just try to match the, the different layers uh, activation from the content itself, right? Uh, but for the style, uh, it's more difficult. You have to do a little bit pre-processing there. You can, you, you really can match the content of the image and content of the artwork. Uh, what we try to uh, do there, uh, it's like we try to define a grand matrix there, uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is defined like here. Uh, we sum over the acti activations uh, let's assume it's uh, your offer, uh, uh, and then you get some uh, uh, feature representation uh, in different layer, and then you sum over the location, and you can get a, a grand matrix for your offer. You do the same thing for one noise, and then you minimize the difference there. So if you compare it to those two guys, it's really it's very similar to each other. Besides the style part, you need to predefine something to represent your style. Do, do you have any intuition for why the square matrix represents your <laughs> feeling about what style is? Uh, no, I what, what is style and what is this and why are those things? Uh, I don't have any intuition, <laughs> right? Mm, and then they didn't mention this in their, in their paper either. Yeah. So, sorry, just some detailed questions. Are those P's in the grand matrix? Those are, what does, what's P, L, uh, I, I, K? Uh, so, it should be the same here. Uh, instead, it's not the photo, it's the A. Oh, I should use a different, uh, different uh, other bit, probably, uh, a different letter. But I see, so that's actually, the grand matrix is being computed with the artwork of the A? Both, both of them. Both. Yes, uh, and you try to minimize the difference between those two guys. Yeah, so, so G, G is computed on the on the image you're generating? It's the uh, X or whatever, the, the new one. And A is the same grand matrix, but just for the artwork? Uh, yes. Is that right? Yeah. G is like for your... So A is fixed. So the, art, the artwork and the generated image X. Those are what you compute your grand matrices with. And then you compute the sum squared difference yes. between those point wise across the grand matrices. And that's what's called the style. Right. Okay. Right. And yeah, and I'm, just, I'm also curious what the intuition is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I actually don't know. Okay. I, don't, I don't know either. I'm actually genuinely asking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't found any discussion of this in the literature. Right. I guess they just try different experiments and this one work. <laughs> yeah, mystery there. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's if you combine everything I just said, uh, you get this uh, still content balanced uh, log function. And uh, you can always calibrate your uh, image as there, and you, gen you finally generate a new image, uh, which is uh, illustrated in, this, in those photos. That's the first artist. Uh, so for the second artist, if you re remember, it's like mm, you have a photo of some internal texture there, and you try to generate a uh, one similar to that. In the previous slide, I showed you a uh, yeah a different one, but uh, here I 
that's the one I generate use the walk. And the idea is to make that up a, a fixed up to zero. And you don't have don't need to have a uh the photo animal. Only the other should be fine. That's that's all. And generally that's that's all for the second artist. So it's like a child of the first artist. The style part. Um, so and the third artist is like uh, can generate uh, is the one can generate the uh, uh, video for that. Uh, do um, do you guys want to say the this video? Like maybe we just say this for ten seconds because it's really cool. Even you know, I we don't have to say that. So here's some video with different filter there. And I think that's a, uh, that's a movie there. Uh, and uh, Star Wars. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? OK, so enough for the video. So it seems the, the challenge there is you could do it frame by frame, but then the particular realization of the style is going to be different, so you have to make it coherent across. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, so the most the trivial uh, implementation is like you just do everything for each frame, but it can have a uh, flirting. Uh, yeah, it's, that's not really helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what they uh, try to do there. Uh, it's like you still keep that uh, function, but for the next frame, you always use the previous frame as the initialization. So it's like you grow something from the previous uh, uh, frame, and then you apply the law function. That's uh, that's the baseline they achieve. In the actual paper, they always do a lot of stuff. Uh, like for example, here they call this uh, short term. Uh, uh, coherence, but they also define some mm -hmm. long-term coherence and uh, modify the log function. But it's irrelevant to the stuff I do, so I won't cover those stuff here. Uh, so finally, we come to this point to gener generate our own uh, dynamic wallpaper video. Uh, and uh, it's also based on the previous people's work. So how we do that? Mm, so just to remind you, like what's the input is? Uh, the input is a dynamic, dynamic wallpaper video like this one, uh, and uh, the first uh, pro the first proposal I make is to uh, like similar to the third artist who generated the video. I use the original video's first frame as our as the new video's first frame, and I. Uh, always apply the loss to the new frame, uh, but I need to keep the initialization as the previous frame. So I initialize the new frame from the previous frame, and I pro provide a driving force uh, to make it uh, make those pixels continuously change uh, by applying the loss uh, style loss here. Uh, so, like for for example, for the next uh, the second frame, I use the first. First frame as an initialization, but I compute the gram matrix uh, from this uh, original video's second frame, and uh, I do the optimization process from here. There, mm, and uh, yeah, it's just the, the same, like exactly the same thing as the first artist for the style. Um, but the one I generated is like this. So nothing really changed. <laughs> I mean, you might expect this because if you, every every frame of the movie is hopefully if if if, if the gram matrix right. captures style properly, the style is kind of invariant statically. Right, right. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I I don't know. I right because I don't want to try the second uh, try before the first try. So yeah, so the first that's all I got from the first one. Uh, yeah, also notice that 
the one function kind of uh, decreasing, although the image itself doesn't change uh, anymore. Uh, so yeah, that's all I get for the style loss approach. Uh, and uh, my reflection is is like like similar to uh, Davis point. There's no enough driving force during the optimization optimization process uh, because if the uh, yeah if the graph matrix is truly defined the style the style for different frames should be very similar. So uh, for the second, so I tried the second approach called Compton loss. Approach, and what I try to do is like I kind of the lower my expectations to gener to generate something brand new. Uh, I try to at least generate something. So this something should have two feature, two uh, attributes there. The first is like uh, I have to provide some driving force to make a change from the initial frame, and I also. I uh, would like to change it, change it gradually, so at least I can have a visual, the appealing video to show something change. So that's what what I try to do there. Uh, so the second try I propose is uh, content loss. So almost uh, similar to the first uh, approach. The only difference is like I uh, I publish the content loss. Uh, con uh, the activations actually for the second frame and apply for the new frame. Uh, and during this uh, optimalization process, uh, I can always save the snapshot, uh, snapshot of the those images. And this, so here, I uh, it's like um, it's it's uh, it should initially looks like the first frame. But as I do this uh, uh, optimalization process over, I can always gen generate a lot of images there. So I not only uh, generate one frame, I get the entire process to generate the second frame. And uh, what about to make the, those uh, all the images a uh, video? So I got, uh, oh yeah, and it's exactly the same as the first uh, application. Uh, I got this. Uh, I got this one. Uh, it can make uh, another circle. I assume. Probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another change, as you can see there. Uh, so the second approach is uh, uh, accomplished by this one. Uh, but I'm so we're watching the learning dynamics here, is that right? Uh, we're watching the learning dynamics uh, yes. between two, going from frame one to frame two. Yes, and you you can see how it's gradually changed. But uh, but we can call this a video. It's a video how to learn the second frame, <laughs> all right. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the problem of this approach is like is gradually converging to the next frame. And doesn't change anymore. Uh, so the idea is like, why not we just uh, never make it uh, uh, convert it to any point? Uh, we, we always uh, like it, it, there's a lot of stress strategy there. I assume, uh, for example, you can only generate uh, fifteen images in this process, and then you change your training objective to the Another frame, and uh, you you never wait for its convergence, and you change its uh, objective. Uh, so that's uh, what I call the circle circulational content loss approach. Um, so the point I should say is like uh, you don't need to wait for its convergence. You can you can go where you come from, as always. Uh, so how's uh, how's this approach go? Uh, I probably uh, had to show you the. Uh, wait, let me uh, show you the not only the video but the image itself to illustrate my point. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Yeah, I see. 
given this here. So should we start from here? So uh, it's really, really quick, but you can change it. it. It doesn't converge to any point because I only set, I only grab 15 image for uh, each process and uh, combine all the image together. Uh, and one more interesting stuff is like. Uh, at a certain point, uh, this image yeah, is the uh, uh, 47, 48. It's a uh, log function, like it's low. So you can also see there in this uh, image, uh, it like blur. Uh, I don't know why would that happen. And I actually didn't expect that, but uh, it's like after this point, they, it gradually convert back, so so that's that's another observation. Um, it's probably have something to do with uh, optimalization strategy strategy there, but I'm not sure. Uh, but at least uh, we generate some uh, we generate some videos there, so that's uh, that's what I call the third approach. Mm, okay. Any questions at this point? Questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's the third approach. So my conclusion is like we will choose the third approach as an approach to generate some dynamic world in our beam. So I guess the, the I, intuition or the, the idea that I, I thought would, uh, would work well would, was a uh, you have this gray matrix that tells you something about the the statistical structure within an image. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have two frames, mm -hmm. uh, you could define a temporal gray matrix that tells you about the, the filter activations in frame one, how, how they're correlated with the filter activations in frame two, mm -hmm. and so you have the, uh, a static gray matrix for the static structure and the temporal gray matrix for the, the temporal structure. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could condition on frame one generate a frame two. Is there is there a reason that that doesn't work? So like, what's the exact definition of the temporal frame matrix? Uh, it would be the same thing except instead of having the filter activation uh, I, IJL uh, and, uh, uh, and and then the other filter at the, at the same at the same point in the same image it would be at the same space location in the oh, so you sum over different frames of right, activation. Right. Uh, for the gram matrix, right? You get two two gram matrices. One one is just a a, a, a gram matrix for, for the style as okay. as Becker did, and then have another one for the the temporal correlation structure. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, in that way, it seems like you have to you need three frames. One to two, one to two, three. Because you sum over different frames, gram matrix. So for one gram matrix, you need at least two image. Uh, I see. What you're yeah, I'm not imagining summing over over time. Oh, okay. I'm still summing over over space. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but just multiplying two different yeah. uh, activations. Okay. Uh, and for me, I feel like because there's an internal, we assume there's an internal texture in this video. Um, no matter you sum over what, you always get something like uh, very similar to this video's internal gram matrix, which is like similar for like all the frame. Mm -hmm. So that's. Yeah, so the. I, is what you're saying is that the gram matrix um, at every frame for these textures mm -hmm. is kind of the same. Mm -hmm. So if you tried to estimate this temporal thing, it would be, I don't know, close to, mm -hmm. um, close to one or something? Is that the way uh, gram matrix is like a dot product, right? It's like 
think or close to just the the, the static one maybe yeah or right so you just wouldn't because there's not much change in the in, in the, the um, across time for the grand matrix that that was the problem right is that, right and so then that's why you're into a static is because you, you could match the grand matrix just as well in frame i as in frame i plus one with the same image right, right. there's what if you did something more uh, uh brute force kind of and just um forced the images to change some uh, yeah so find a local change that um and this may actually be somewhat similar to the circulation of content thing, but I guess I'm just saying, mm -hmm. add in some, something in the loss function that, that says you get lower loss if frames i and i plus one are different from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But I also need to like, define the destination, like where should it go? Yeah, I, I guess I would stick with the style. Well, what you're trying to match is style. Right. Right. Yes. And so I was a little bit confused when you switched to content because you know, I, I guess I thought yeah. the whole style. So, um, right. although the content thing did seem to give you something that, that sort of worked in a way, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So as I'm imagining, you stick with the style objective. You just add something yeah. that, uh, like like you were saying, like more of a driver that says, you know, make sure you're moving uh, in the space, right. uh, but, but still try to match the style. Right, yeah, that's the dilemma of this task uh, from my point. Uh, because um, you try to uh, generate a new video with a similar uh, texture, a similar style. So intuitionally, you would use the style. However, since this style are the same, for almost the same for each frame, it doesn't provide enough driving force. So I have no, no other method other than its content. So that's, that's what I preserve there. There should be some way to explicitly compute temporal correlations right. and create some sort of temporal grand matrix that is, asked, is saying, you know, okay, here, here's, here's in detail what frame one is, then I know that I want to have some sort of temporal correlations on average, so I'm going to generate frame two accordingly. Mm -hmm. There should be some way to. Yeah. And I think, right, in the grand matrix thing you mentioned before might actually, like, might work, or yeah, but there's gotta be some. You, you, might, you might have to do what you're saying, which is create the temporal grand matrix by averaging over many, many pairs. Oh, nice. Okay. three, but the whole, the whole movie, um, or something yeah. like that. But the way, the way you do it for static, you average over space, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the future work <laughs> <laughs> to do. Okay, so. That's some of my some of my reference and uh, thank you. So one one other little technical question. You described convolutional neural networks as a dimensionality reduction technique. Yes. Um, you can also use you know principal components analysis or random projections or something for uh, dimensionality reduction. What's the difference between a convolutional model and something like a PCA? And why is a convolutional model more appropriate for this kind of problem? Uh, I don't know what PCA is, but uh, okay. uh, go ahead. Well, okay, I mean, uh, rather than say learning a linear Projection actually, yeah. So it's it is kind of the contrast between this bottom, uh, um, fully connected. This yeah, the sort of fully connected model that learns a linear projection of all of the um, points oh, onto see. some a smaller set of dimensions. Mm -hmm. So say your original grid is five by five, you can project that onto a three by three grid mm -hmm. um, in uh, you know via a, a linear map that captures most of the variance in the, mm -hmm. of the original mm -hmm. uh, square. Like, like for me, at least uh, there's a one advantage. It's like, uh, it's easy to implement. You just drop out some connections. You can, uh, uh, you get a convolutional. Okay, but I think there's, there's more to it than, than that. 
<laughs> um, and that's and it's particularly helpful for images. So think of the, um, mm -hmm. uh, um, like an image recognition kind of problem. Maybe it's, it's clearer mm -hmm. in that setting. So say you're trying to determine whether there's a coffee cup mm -hmm. in the image. Why would convolution? Oh, I see. I see. So it should be some uh, invariants for the space. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Oh. But the way you described it, there's no there's no invariance. You just have locality of connections. To get to get the invariance, you have to tie tie the weights. I guess no. I guess it'd be other focus. Oh. Oh yeah. I guess I was assuming the weights were tied. So and they are. They are. Oh. Okay. Uh. Yeah. There's also one point. The the paper I just mentioned for the neural arc, they said they always use the partially connect layer, whether it's cooling or Convolution. They never use the fully connected layer right. to yeah. calculate the the grand metrics or whatever activations, yeah. uh, which kind of makes sense. Yeah, I guess I just want to take a slight issue with the dimensionality reduction here. The the, mm -hmm. the way you get uh, reduced dimensionality is basically because of the size, the edge effects, and the size of your filter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Really, the, where the dimensionality reduction comes in is in the max cooling. Mm -hmm. That's that's the bulk of it. So what's the question? Uh, I, I think with the convolutional network, mm -hmm. the, most of the, of the dimensionality reduction comes with, with the pooling operation, not with that. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah in some sense, a hundredfold filters generate more features for each block. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's also dependent if you have, for this one, it's a special uh, genre of the convolution. Some people, Always put a lot of zero on the end. Right. They call it tiny. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, question that I forgot. <laughs> okay. We still have time. I book this class uh, this week to two thirty. We don't need. I don't need that lot. <laughs> yes. I, I can't remember that. <laughs> Questions for you guys? Yeah. I have my, I have my question then, and I heard those. Yeah. Okay. This clarified a lot, so I can deliver. Yeah, I want to thank the people who uh, come and join the rehearsal. Yeah. And the professors join here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it doesn't tell you where. Yeah, but I think you just...